Yes, the time is 4 p.m. in Sacramento, 6 p.m. in Nashville. Welcome to How Hacks Happen. I hope you're all sitting down because you're going to get hacked. For those of you in Nashville watching in real time, you're going to get hacked. For those of you in Memphis watching in real time, you're going to get hacked. For those of you watching on demand, whenever, wherever, you're going to get hacked too. It's just a matter of time. You're going to get hacked unless you do what I say. My name is Mark Anthony Jamanos. I am a certified ethical hacker. What exactly does an ethical hacker do, you may say? An ethical hacker goes into an office and audits the network security or lack of security. I've seen a lot. Then we document the biggest vulnerabilities and we work with the business owner or the principal to remediate those. Basically, we fix the biggest problems first. Bringing in an ethical hacker is like bringing in the fire department to tell you where a fire would probably break out if a fire happened in your office. We're the good guys. You should bring in an ethical hacker at least once a year. Now, I have a slideshow, so let me start sharing my screen for you. Little background on me, I already talked about how I'm a certified ethical hacker, but also I have certifications from EC Council and Microsoft, and I've been a computer guy since 1991. Today's presentation is sponsored by my fourth book, How Hacks Happen. In How Hacks Happen, there are two author personas. There's me, Mark, the good guy, who wants to protect you, because I'm the good guy. And there's Brad Cracker, the bad guy, who wants to rip you off. Brad says, Hey, man, I'm good at hacking. Hacking is easy. I like the easy money, and I wish Mark would shut up because he's making my job harder. And that is Brad Cracker's worldview. Today, I'm talking about ransomware, and here is a prompt that many ransomware victims saw when they went to work one day back in 2017. This is WannaCry. It hit the hospitals in the United Kingdom and it hit them hard. And I'm going to be showing this prompt four times in this slideshow. There's a lot of text on here and I know it's kind of small, but basically this is telling you how you can pay a ransom to the ransomer authors. You have a deadline and the longer you wait, the more expensive the ransom becomes. Until you pay the ransom, your data is encrypted. You cannot get to it, so you're stuck. And if you don't have a plan to get back in business that is outside of paying the ransom, then you'll have to pay the ransom and pray that the ransomware developers actually follow through on their end of the deal to give you the encryption key, which will let you decrypt the data they encrypted. And there's a 50-50 chance of that. This is WannaCry. It happened to hospitals in the United Kingdom back in 2017. We're not 100% sure who is behind it, but those in the know say North Korea. It's because they hate America and the friends of America, including the United Kingdom. WannaCry had a big impact on the hospitals in the United Kingdom. Admissions went down 16%. And in the emergency department, emissions went down 1,100. Can you imagine going to the hospital in London with blood coming on your eye sockets and having the receptionist tell you, I'm sorry, that computers are down. Can you come back next week? It really happened May 2017, United Kingdom. I have a movie that I'm going to show you of WannaCry's spread. So let me share my sound and turn off my camera and play this video. And as you watch this video, watch the timer in the lower left-hand corner because you'll see how rapidly it spreads. When we're in the first 24 hours, we're still in day zero. And it's pretty scary. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So if somebody is reading the firewall logs and they're saying, yeah, I know how it got in here. It came from Kansas City. Well, yes, maybe it came to you from Kansas City, but it piggybacked off Kansas City to get to you. So you have to trace it further. Where was it before it got to Kansas City? Maybe you'll have access to that info, maybe not. But for people in the health industry where they're subject to HIPAA compliance regulations, they have the burden of HIPAA compliance. And in the HIPAA rule, we learned that the HIPAA security rule requires implementation of security measures that can help prevent the introduction of malware, including ransomware. So for everybody in the US who got hit by WannaCry, they failed this. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain. And remember, for ransomware or malware or remote access Trojan hackers, they have to be successful on all seven steps. You, as a defender, have to be successful at breaking this chain. So here are the steps. Step one is reconnaissance. You learn about your target. Are they a political party or a politician? Are they a local ma and pa grocer? Choose a target and study them. You can study them with information online. We call this OSINT or open source intelligence. You can also go and hang out in the parking lot and see when people show up at work. Next step is weaponization. You decide what kind of weapon you're gonna to create to exploit that target. Number three is delivery. You decide how you're gonna get that weapon to them. Is it going to be on USB memory sticks? Will it be on a fish email? Will it be a post on social media like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, whatever vehicle you choose? Then there's exploitation, which is you launching the attack and getting somebody to fall into a trap, into a trap, into a trap. If you're doing a USB key drop, you get people to pick up the USB memory key and stick it into their computer. If it's an attack through phishing, then you're enticing people to click a link they should not click. Number five is installation. And that's when the malware that you got to people actually installs completely on your target's workstation. Number six is command and control. After you have your malware on that workstation, then it should phone home. It should recontact the command control center and report in. Then you'll know that you have remote access to another computer that's part of your botnet. And number seven, actions on objectives. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Do you wanna attack a big multinational corporation like Sony Pictures, like what Republic of North Korea did? Or are you going after a ma and pa grocery or are you going after a political party? This is the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. 
The attacker has to be successful at all seven steps. You as the defender have to be successful at breaking this once. And that usually means over here before step five, installation. If you tell people, don't go picking up USB memory sticks in the parking lot, then you broke the chain right here. If you have good security awareness training and people know to vet links before clicking them, or if they're not sure, just delete that email, you broke the link right here. But since malware and ransomware is so prevalent, we can conclude that the hackers are successful at all seven steps. And the good guys, the defenders, were not able to break here before step five, which I think would be the easiest place to break the chain. Now I talked about a USB key drop. This is one easy way to spread malware. What you can do is go to a target. Maybe they're local. Maybe they have a warehouse nearby. And in that warehouse, you go and scout them out. You go hang out in your car in the parking lot Monday at 7 a.m. For the next hour, you see that 25, maybe 30 cars arrive in the parking lot and people go in the building. So you know that between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. is when 25, maybe 30 people come into work. Then you decide, well, maybe I should create my malware and put it on 50 USB memory sticks. And I'll scatter them on different days and I'll make sure they're in the parking lot before 7 a.m. Remember, we're trying to stay kind of concealed here. If you flood the parking lot with USB memory sticks, somebody would get suspicious. Or if you drop five on Monday and five on Tuesday and five on Wednesday in different areas, then you're kind of under the radar. You won't draw suspicion. Let's look at the next slide. It's going to be the wanna cry prompt again. This may be the end result. You want to harvest data from the target's computer or from their server, and then give your target an opportunity to give you a ransom or pay your ransom. Back in the spring, I went canvassing here in Sacramento, and I was talking about this ransom or recovery plan. And I say, what would you guys do if a fire, flood, or theft happened here, or ransomware got on your network? Well, you can have a system image backup. Therefore, if ransomware gets on your network, you just restore your system from this. Option B is you pay the ransom. I'm not a fan of that, but some people would because it's their most attractive option. And some people, I kid you not, they told me, well, I think we pray. <laughs> Not really a laughing matter, but I was amazed how often people said they would pray. If you got ransomware on your network and you can't get to your data and your computers don't work, it's a little late for prayer. Let's have some audience participation here. We saw the three options to prepare for ransomware. Now, some of my peers believe that it's not an if question, but it's a when question. When ransomware gets on your network, how do you respond? So let me stop and ask, what is your organization planning to do? And if you don't know, then what do you think you would recommend to the bosses at your organization? This is the audience participation part, so you can Turn off your mute or type something in the chat window. How are you preparing for ransomware? I probably want a backup. It states it says backup. Yeah. Okay, and thank you.
Uh, Joanne Jared, what what do you do? Uh, my company we uh typically run um biweekly NIST um NIST certified. What do you call it? I'm sorry. NIST certified uh ransomware checks and uh anti uh anti attack uh software. So by it sounds like you're doing scans. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from this screen, what option would you choose, or what do you think your organization would choose? Oh, from this screen, definitely we would back up. We would back it up. But it's also according on the proprietary nature of the uh, of what has been hacked. So. Sometimes you have to pay the money. Because yeah. you don't have the backups available. Yeah. Okay. How about one more? How about Joanna? How would you or your organization respond? And I think you're on mute. Alexandra, how what's what do you think your organization would do? I would back it up. Yeah. Okay. Do you know if your organization is already doing these backups on a schedule? Um uh, on a schedule? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's continue on. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> let's suppose I wanted to attack Wells Fargo. They're big. So I need to do a lot of work to make this attack happen. I will apply the cyber kill chain again. I'm doing reconnaissance. And I know that they have good security at their branches. They could very well have $10,000 firewalls at each branch and VPNs back to a main office. For the weaponization, I can create something that I think would work on their network. I'd find out from reconnaissance kind of that they're using Windows servers. So I'd create some malware or ransomware that will work on Windows. Delivery, I might do a USB key drop. I might send them phishing emails. Exploitation, make the emails so attractive that at least one out of 10, maybe one out of 20 people would click a link they should not click. If I do the USB key drop, I would put some label on the USB key. And I might put a label on here that says 2023, Christmas bonuses. Now, who wouldn't want to look at that? People like to find out what other people are getting paid or bonused. Number five is installation. If people are clicking a link in a phish email, then malware gets installed on the workstation. If they're inserting a USB memory key into a USB port, then something gets installed completely on their workstation. Number six, command control. That applet that they install is going to be small. Therefore, the install will be quick, but it'll phone home to a command control center. Then number seven, act on objectives. Maybe I want to go after Wells Fargo, or maybe I just want to leverage Wells Fargo's network in my botnet to attack somebody like Sony Pictures or a Republican or Democratic a uh, candidate for office. The election season is coming up. Now, when I said there are a lot of people who work for Wells Fargo, I wasn't kidding. Over 200,000 of them are using LinkedIn. And this doesn't count how many work at Wells Fargo, but don't use social media. They're not using LinkedIn. They're not using Facebook. They're not using TikTok. They're not using anything. 
This is just a number of LinkedIn accounts with people who say they work at Wells Fargo. <clears throat> I may decide that attacking a Wells Fargo branch is too difficult. Therefore, I'm gonna find somebody on LinkedIn who works at Wells Fargo. And maybe I go after the poor soul named Daphne Prancer. Daphne goes into the workplace two days a week and she works elsewhere three days a week. Maybe she works at home, maybe she goes to a coffee shop and she hops on the free Wi-Fi, which she shouldn't do, but she doesn't do the security awareness training, so she doesn't know. So yes, she is gonna hop on the free Wi-Fi at a coffee shop or she's gonna work at home. One thing for sure, when she's at home, she is not behind a $10,000 firewall. Maybe she is when she goes to work, but when she's at home, there's no $10,000 firewall. Heck, Daphne here is still paying off her student loans and eating macaroni and cheese three nights a week. No $10,000 firewall here. I already know Daphne goes to the workplace two days a week and she works elsewhere, usually at home, the other three days. That's my reconnaissance. Let's go one step further to weaponization. What I'm gonna do is create a weapon that harvests data. And the reason I wanna harvest data is so I know how much I can charge for the ransom. If Daphne is a ma and pa grocery store and barely making payroll every two weeks, I can't charge that much for the ransom. But if Daphne has access to data on Wells Fargo servers, then it's almost the sky's the limit on what I can charge for a ransom. I'm also gonna encrypt data. It's important to encrypt the data after I harvest it, because the next step after encrypting data is to give people an opportunity to pay the ransom. So I kind of have to work backwards. I want to give them the ransomware prompt, that happens after I encrypt data, and that happens after I harvest data, so I can determine how much I can charge for the ransom. When it comes to harvesting data, I'm going to harvest all that I can, because the more research I do to find out what this organization does, the more valuable it'll be, the higher I can charge for a ransom and have a reasonable expectation that the target will pay. Let's go one step further and talk about encryption. And this is something I talked about last week. Encryption uses a key. If I were to send some data to Exandra and I encrypted it, I would share the encryption key with Exandra in advance. Exandra would know that I am encrypting the data. Therefore, when she receives it, it's gonna look like computer garbage, but Exandra can use that same key I shared with her to decrypt the data and figure out the message. In this example, I have a key of plus five. And what I'm saying is that every character in the message will be incremented up by five. The U becomes V W X Y Z. The N becomes O P Q R S. The I becomes J K L M N. And I'm sure you get the picture. Now, if Malicious Mallory is running Wireshark and she's capturing traffic, she's gonna see what's in blue and she won't know it has her tails because she does not have the encryption key. Exandra does. So Exandra can decrypt with that same encryption key. She'll take what is in blue that looks like computer garbage and decrypt it to something that is intelligent. This is how encryption works. This is what we did in World War II, knowing that we were communicating over radio, but um, the Germans were also listening in. We encrypted messages, we encrypted telegraphs with the same strategy as what we have here. This is a short encryption key. This is only three bits. So there's a one, a two, and a four. The one bit is on, the two bit is off, the four bit is on. That's how I got the key of plus five. It's only a three bit key. There are websites with encryption that uses 256 bits or 512 bits or 1024 bits, much, much longer 
are more difficult to guess the encryption key. And it's also part of the reason why you need a powerful computer because all the traffic you're sending back and forth that is encrypted by the sender needs to be decrypted by the recipient. So if you're filling out a form with a credit card number because you're about to buy something at Amazon, you're encrypting with the key, the public key that Amazon gave you. And of course, on Amazon's end, they're decrypting the message with the private key that they are keeping secure. The third step is that the ransomware publisher or the attacker will give you the opportunity to pay the ransom. Remember that the logic here, number one was harvest data, two, encrypt, and three, give the target an opportunity to pay the ransom. Because these hackers view hacking as a business. Now, some people clean teeth for a living. Some people fix transmissions for a living. Some people publish ransomware for a living. They hack. And in some countries, hacking is not illegal. Yeah, you heard that right. Hacking, not illegal. That includes the, the American haters like Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Heck, there, if you hack the rich Americans, it's even better because the rich Americans were the great Satan, according to some people. This wraps up step two, the weaponization. Right now, we're just creating a weapon. We haven't distributed it and we haven't tricked Daphne Prancer to installing it on our workstation. We're just creating the weapon and testing it internally. Is everybody clear so far? You said in some countries it's, it's not illegal. Um, Correct, hacking is not illegal in some countries, including Russia, Iran, and North Korea. So what did they post? So what would happen if somebody was to hack into somebody's bank account? Uh, is that different? Well, if they hack into a bank account of somebody in another country, so be it. Oh, okay. Pretty scary. This expectation of lawlessness in other countries. Hmm. Okay. Everybody clear? I saw one thumb come up. I think that was Stacy. Alexandra has a thumbs up. Jared has a thumbs up. All right, let's continue on. Let's go to delivery. How do I get my payload to the target? Which in this case is poor Daphne Prancer, who's eating macaroni and cheese three nights a week. I'm gonna deliver this through a phishing email. Poor Daphne wakes up one morning and it's one of these days when she does not go into the workplace. She gets an email like this. Your Gmail password will expire within 24 hours. Then there's a link. Click here to reset the password and acquire your email within 24 hours or your account will be exterminated. Now Daphne's half awake and she hasn't had her morning coffee, but she knows that she needs to keep her Gmail alive. So Daphne clicks that link and it's going to come back to haunt her. When you look at phishing email or email that you suspect is phishing, apply three rules. If there's a yes on one of these rules, just go ahead and delete the message. So the rules are number one, is there an unnecessary sense of urgency? Number two, is there a link that does not make sense? And number three, is there awkward grammar? Let's talk about number one, unnecessary sense of urgency. Do we really need to keep that account alive by clicking a link within 24 hours? I don't see the urgency there. So I'd have to say yes on unnecessary sense of urgency. Number two is link that does not make sense. What you can do is 
hover your mouse pointer over a link, which in this case would be the click here, and your computer will give you a box telling you where you would end up if you click that link. Some people will hover, or some people, like poor Daphne, who hasn't had her morning coffee, will just click it anyway without thinking twice. And number three, awkward grammar. What is happening in that last sentence? Acquire your email within 24 hours or your account will be exterminated. Do we exterminate email accounts? No, we do not. We disable email accounts if they're not being used or if the employee leaves. We don't exterminate email accounts. We exterminate roaches. We disable email accounts. So I have to say yes on awkward grammar. Let's talk about that link, the click here to reset the password link. Daphne, being half awake, clicks the link and she gets a prompt to type in her Google password. This page looks like a Google login page and this could be for YouTube, for Gmail, for AdWords, for AdSense or any other Google service. But the trick is on Daphne because what she thinks is a Google login page is not. When you look at the address bar more closely, we see that she's not at Google. Instead, she's at a spoof site, cybersafetynet.biz slash gmail.com. She's not in any Google domain. She's at a spoof site I created. And that spoof site creates this box. And people are falling for this a lot. And these are people who find that their bank accounts get drained down to $1 or they have illegitimate charges on the credit card. Or they find that somebody else is getting into their email because they're going to pages like this thinking that it's Google, but it's not. And they're typing in their email address and password. So back here, Daphne already typed in her email address and she hit next. Of course, she wound up here. Then she types in her password. She's still at my spoof site. She hits enter or she clicks next. Then Daphne winds up at a legitimate Google login page. At this point, Daphne is thinking, I must have had a typo on my password. Heck, I haven't had my coffee yet. So she'll type in her Gmail or Google password again and she'll get into the Google service she's trying to get to. She gets in and she thinks nothing of it. But what happens is I get an email with her legitimate password. So Daphne back here is at my spoof site. She's typing in her email address. She's clicking next. She's typing in her password. Now, if I were to make it so she get this screen again and she typed in her password again and it failed and she got the screen again, she typed in her password again, she might get suspicious. But if I can make it so this appears just once, then she winds up at the legitimate Google login screen. She'll type in her password again and get into her Gmail and think nothing of it. Of course, she doesn't know this happened. Delivery and exploitation. The delivery was that email that I sent to Daphne. And the exploitation is that I exploited her and her <clears throat> half awakeness to click a link and type in her Gmail username, then type in her Gmail password. <laughs> In addition to me getting her Gmail username and password, I install a small applet on her machine, and I call it Hide. It installs into the C colon backslash temp folder. It's so fast that Daphne doesn't notice it. And if Daphne, if Daphne logs in with administrator privileges, then 
whatever's in hide will install automatically. And that's part of the reason why we don't have people use administrative privileges when they're web surfing or checking email, because you never know what's gonna get on their machine and install automatically. Hide is a remote access Trojan that gives me uh, remote access into her workstation. So back here, when I was talking about Daphne clicking a link she shouldn't have clicked, then providing her Gmail username and her password, well, she was also downloading Hide and she was running Hide and then she was bringing up the spoof website that I showed you earlier. <laughs> now this happens pretty fast because Hide is small. Doesn't have to be big. Just has to install and then call back to the command and control center. This is installation. Now, if Daphne had security awareness training, or if Daphne had her morning coffee before clicking a the link, then that chain probably would have been broken here. But that did not happen. My remote access Trojan is on Daphne's computer. Now her computer can call back to the command and control center, sometimes called C2. Now these people are watching to see what remote access Trojans they have up and running, where they are, in what countries, in what cities. Since they have remote access to these computers, they can push more aggressive payloads. They can launch a distributed denial of, ser denial of service against somebody, like Sony Pictures. They can try to infiltrate the network to get hold of some movies that have not yet been released. As long as people in command control centers like this in random parts of the world, but usually countries that hate America, then they now have a botnet and they can use that botnet to their benefit. With remote access Trojans, they can issue commands through apps like this Sub7. Now Sub7 is pretty simple compared to a lot of what's out there, but it can cause a lot of damage. You can set a password at the target. So if you just want to mess with the target, set a password, and of course, don't tell them. Then you can wait until they restart the computer. They'll be prompted for a password that they don't know. You can remove a password. So if the user has a password and they've been using that password for years, you can remove the password. Then the next time they restart the computer or try to log in again, they'll type the password, but they'll be wrong because there will be no password. The password will be blank. There's also an option to restart the server. Imagine how much damage that can do. Restart servers at random times. This is a remote access Trojan. <laughs> this is the control module. And of course, what resides on the target's computer would be in hide or whatever remote access Trojan you're using. Let's continue on to actions on objectives. And I'm gonna show you that WannaCry prompt again. Remember with WannaCry and any ransomware in general, the logic is export data so you can determine how much to charge for a ransom, then encrypt the data, then give the target the opportunity to pay your ransom. And here is our WannaCry invitation to pay the ransom again. Now, some people would say, well, I guess our hands are tied. We have to pay that ransom. The FBI does not concur. The FBI has the opposite policy on ransomware. And I'm going to read this verbatim in case anybody has audio only. The FBI says, the FBI does not encourage paying a ransom to criminal actors. Paying a ransom may embolden adversaries to target additional organizations, encourage other criminal actors to engage in the distribution of ransomware, 
and or fund illicit activities. Paying the ransom also does not guarantee that a victim's files will be recovered. And there's a 50-50 chance that the people who put ransomware on your computer will follow through on their promise to give you the encryption key after you sent them the ransom. They've already proven that they're criminal, but you're expecting them to be honorable. I just don't think so. There's something else to watch out for, and that is if you or your organization pays a ransom, you go on a list of payers. So the ransomware people may come back to you in four months or six months and hit you with ransomware again with the expectation that you'll pay. It's like going to the local pizza shop and buying a pizza, then giving them your email address so they can send you coupons. Well, yeah, they're going to send you coupons because they think you're going to come in and buy pizza from them again. You will be a repeat customer. And the ransomware publishers have that same strategy. They want you to be a repeat customer because after all, they're running a business too. They uh, have to put a, a roof over their heads. They have to put food on the table. They have to buy a new pair of shoes. And chances are they're in a country where hacking is not illegal. With this information, you have a big decision to make. How are you going to prepare for the when? When ransomware strikes, how are you going to prepare? There's option one, do system image backups. And I think you know by now, I'm a fan of this. There's the other option of prayer, which I think is irresponsible. But there's a third option. And that is that some people, when they get hit by ransomware, will go to Google and they'll say, ah, I'm going to outsmart these ransomware people. I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to find other people who have had the same ransomware and I'm going to find out what they did to recover from this ransomware because Lord knows they are computer experts. They're not expert enough to do system image backups once a week, once a month, or once a quarter. But gosh darn, when all their data is encrypted, they're going to become an expert and go to Google and figure out how to break this ransomware. And that is quite a beautiful plan. What you do is create a system image backup. And I'm going to play a video that's a little over two minutes long of creating a system image. I'm going to make sure that I am sharing the sound again. And I am. Here comes the second video of the day. This application is in Windows 7 and Windows 10 and Windows 11. The challenge for you is make sure that you do these backups. Heck, the software is free and these are super cheap at Amazon. I hit pause while recording to make this recording a lot shorter. Otherwise, it would be about 30 minutes long. A system repair disk is usually a DVD that you'd insert into the drive. 
if you don't already have a system repair disk. This is your system image backup. Keep the media, in this case, the blue system image drive somewhere safe. And I'll be talking about storing this safely in a few minutes because different people have different ideas. Some are smart, some are not. Everybody clear so far? Stacy and Alexandra, thumbs up. Jared has a thumbs up. Ethan and Antonio are here. Hello, you must have snuck in. You guys clear so far? Peter Antonio, you guys clear? Looking for a thumbs up. Or maybe they stepped away. So let's continue on. It is a when question, not an if question. When you get ransomware. Therefore, you got to plan for it in advance. Here's a good strategy for you. You can create system image backups like this quarterly. After you create this system image backup, store this somewhere safe. And then you have some other backup software that backs up data nightly. The benefit of this is that if you have ransomware and the company decides to take the drive from the server or your workstation out, Put in a new drive, then restore. <clears throat> you restore from this. This has your system image. It has your operating system, your drivers, your programs, and your data as it existed when you made this backup. Then you restore from your nightly backup to get the data that has changed since you made this backup. We're at the end of the quarter. Let's suppose that you did this backup tomorrow when you went to work. Then when it finishes, you label it as Q4 2023. You'll take that backup and store it off-site somewhere. Your nightly backups will continue. Then let's suppose you get ransomware on Valentine's Day next year. You'll put in a new drive. You'll restore your system from here. Now this will get your system back to how it was on December 29, 2023, which was the last business day of the quarter. Then you restore from your nightly backups and that brings back all the data that has changed since you made this. Storing the drive is a big issue because different people have different ideas. I have a client who, <clears throat> once again, I kid you not, did not be backups and then stored them in his SUV in the parking lot in the middle of summer. And I told him, you know, it's the middle of summer, it's hotter than hell in your SUV and you're storing your backups there and they're sitting there all day. Maybe it's too hot for the media, or maybe someone breaks into your SUV, or maybe they just steal it all together. So I don't think storing these in a car is a good idea. What I advocate is taking them to the bank and putting them in a vault. <clears throat> I have a safe deposit box in the vault at a local bank. And I put these in that box. I did that because I think the box in the vault at my bank is more secure than my home that has 
big windows in the front. If I'm out of town for a weekend and somebody breaks in, either they come through the front door or they come in through one of the windows, and I'm storing these on my desk, they can grab these in a New York minute and head out. But if these are somewhere safe, like in a safe deposit box, in the vault, at the bank, then they are much more secure. Something else you need to do with your backups is to test them because we want to make sure that they really do work. With drives like this, I usually do a test restore into the into a virtual machine, or I will go to the not the backup and restore into sql and backslash temp. I restore at least once a month, and I just do test restores. It's good to know that backups are working because the time to find out that backups are failing is not when you're trying to recover from a disaster. Instead, it's much more convenient if one of your tests fails and then you get to figure out why. Is this bad? Is the cable bad? Is the cable not plugged in at all? Test your backups by doing test restores. We're looking at the cyber kill chain again. The attacker has to be successful with all seven steps. You just have to break the chain once. And I think the easiest way is right over here at step five. Teach your people not to grab USB memory sticks in the parking lot and plug them into the computers. Teach your people to think twice before clicking links in unexpected emails. If the attackers are attacking you through phishing emails, teach people to vet the links. Also, to vet the senders. If there's some unexpected email from somebody that they don't know, be suspicious. And of course, vet unexpected email. It could be an email from somebody you know, or even worse, it could be an email that forged the name and email address in the front field of somebody you know asking you to do something, like click the link and then wire some money. People need to be cautious. Now you have options. You can create system image backups. You can stockpile some cash, or you can go to work tomorrow and forget everything I've talked about here and maintain the status quo. You know, it's the end of the quarter, it's the end of the year, maybe you have a holiday party, you'll forget everything. But let me ask, what you gonna do? And I'm gonna look in the chat window and I'm gonna ask you to turn off mute. What you gonna do? Who wants to be first? How about Antonio or Kita? I know you guys are back. Or I think you're back. And you're both on mute. How about Joanne? Joanna, what you gonna do? Um, I missed the entire list, and so I'm I'm, the, I'm confused on what what the question is. Okay, the question is, what are you gonna advocate when you go back to work tomorrow? Are you gonna advocate doing system image backups once a quarter? Are you gonna advocate stockpiling cash? Or do you got other things to think about? Oh, um, guess other things to think about. Thank you. <laughs> How about somebody else? How about Alexandra?
I'm sorry, Craig, how are you? Well, first I have a question about the backup drive. Okay, um, what's the question? It might be a stupid question, but what if, okay, so you plug your back your uh your your backup drive into the computer and it's not working and you think it is something wrong with the USB cord. So you go and get another USB cord and mm -hmm. you find out that it's not the USB cord, it's the it might be stripped or something might be wrong with the backup drive and you can't get the information off of it. What do you do then? Do you have an extra one? So are you setting up the backup or are you testing the restore? Uh, I'm asking this question because I got a backup drive where it got mm. uh, old pictures and stuff on it and it's stripped. <laughs> it's stripped and I can't get I can't get in it. Um, it's stripped. Yeah, like. Uh, does your computer give you a prompt when you plug it in? Yeah, saying it can't it can't connect to the the USB drive. I'll show it. I got this. Can't connect. Do you have you tried plugging it into different ports? It's, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, it's a memory stick. Or is it, I, you're, is it one of these? Yes, it yeah. is. Have you tried plugging that into different USB ports or different computers altogether? No, just my computers. Yeah. Uh, something you can do. If it were a Windows computer and that happened here, is take it to a different computer and see if you get the same result. Also, a lot of times Windows will tell you that there's a problem with the drive and Windows needs to repair the drive. And that repair can take 10, maybe 15 seconds. So is that a drive that you formatted on the Mac? Or did you buy it pre-formatted? Uh, well, actually, it's, uh, when I was going to college, mm -hmm. they gave it to us for free. Um, so they have National College on there, but huh. it won't let me get, you know, well, I would start by testing in different USB ports on your Mac. Then hopefully you have access to somebody else with the Mac. So plug it into theirs and see if you get a different result with that on their computers. And also, if you're still not getting results, find a Windows computer and plug it in and see if Windows tells you that there are errors on the drive and it wants to repair them. So okay, maybe so you have a family member, maybe you have a neighbor who's running Windows, just ask if you can verify the contents of the drive. Would you do the same thing with this little blue thing right here on the screen? Uh, yes, I would. And now the blue with this, there's a cable involved. So I'd probably start by swapping out the cable. And fortunately, I have multiple cables for these. So my first suspicion would be the cable. Then the second suspicion would be a bad USB port. So I'd plug into a different USB port. And then since I have three Windows computers here, I would plug into a different computer and see if I get the same result from three different computers. So hopefully there'll be some step in this chain where I get an opportunity to repair the drive. And then I'll be able to see the data that's on there. Okay. Then you'll be able to recover. And after you, you recover, I'd say copy that data to somewhere else. Because what happens with these USB cords
Okay, here's my iPhone cord. This gold on the tip is very thin and it applies both here and here. So if you're plugging it into USB ports a lot, the gold is gonna wear off. Now, if it's just a cable, you can swap out the cable. But if it's a USB memory stick, like what you're holding, it may be time to replace the drive. So see if you can capture the data from that to somewhere else, like somebody's hard drive, and then buy a new USB memory stick. And they are super cheap these days. And that was not a stupid question. That was a pretty intelligent question. Because a lot of people don't know how reliable their USB memory sticks are until they plug them in and test them. Thank you, Alexandra, for asking that intelligent question. No stupid questions here. Any other questions? Now that we're at the top of the hour. I am done. I know your time is valuable. I know there are other places you could have been, but you chose to be here. You chose to listen to me present How Hacks Happen, which is original content, not part of the Security Plus training. But I think that as I went through this, you may have said, yeah, he talked about this two weeks ago. Yeah, he talked about this three weeks ago. Because I take it original content and plug that into our Security Plus training in several lessons. How about we do a 15 minute break? I'll still be here if you want to work together on a lesson or a lab, or if you just want to adjourn, then you can leave. I will not be offended, but I am going to turn off my camera and start a 15 minute break. If you wanna stick around, fine. If not, that's okay too. I will see you on Tuesday. Same time, same place. Good night, everybody, if you choose to leave.